Hey Saints, this is me like Rebin coming to you with Faithful Wild Healing Ministries. And I'm coming to you again with a prophecy update. Today is Monday, October 22nd, 2018. Um, coming to you um, in a surprising way, um, about approximately just right under three weeks ago, um, I came to you all with the word that the Lord had been giving me over a series of several weeks. And um, when I gave the word, I truly um, felt that it was a final word, which it is. It's still a final word and a final warning um, to, the, to the church in America. Um, but me, myself, I felt that I'm going to, you know, as I gave that word out and the things that the Lord had shared with me to give, that it would be a very long time. And that was in my own assumption um, before he would give me anything else. However, this is not the case. So here we are three weeks later and to my surprise. And I have to say that it was very much to my surprise. Um, I had a visitation from the Lord while I was in Chicago. So I was in Chicago this past weekend. Um, nothing special, just hanging out with my people on my side of the family and my husband. And um, Sunday morning the wee hours of the morning, I had a very, a very powerful encounter with the Lord, totally unexpected, totally did not see this coming. And I'm not saying that the other times I necessarily do. Sometimes I know the Lord is going to like address me, especially in certain seasons, but this was completely unexpected. Like I just did not see this one coming. Um, and so, I, and then I have to share it with you guys, not because of the intensity, because he told me I have to share it with you all. I could not sit on this. There was, this was not one of those situations where I sit on it for a while and then wait to see if he's going to give me something else. Like he gave me everything he wanted me to know in this one setting and said that I had to come back. So I was literally up like the crack of dawn on Sunday in my hotel room, writing this stuff down, trying to get everything, gather as much um, as I could and write it down and jot it down so I wouldn't forget it um, to come back home um, to the Carolinas so that I could, I could share it with you all. So this is my encounter that I have with the Lord that I'm gonna share. I wrote everything down, so um, we're gonna go over uh, several scriptures and um, you guys can write it down. I'll repeat them just so you can write them down and go over it as well. My prayer right now is just that the Holy Spirit has his way. Um, that when you guys hear me speak, that you won't, you're not hearing me speak, but that you'll hear the Holy Spirit speaking through me. My prayer right now is that I will decrease so that the Spirit of the Lord, his righteousness and his truth will increase as I give this word forth to the church this evening. Um, my encounter began with this. I was in a church, the Lord came to me, Jesus came to me and he was dressed in a beautiful white robe um, that went down to his feet and he had a bronze belt tied around his waist. I've never seen him in a, in a bronze belt. And he was to my right. And when Jesus ever encounters me, like when I encounter himself, like I'm not going, he, I see him from the time I was six, seven years old is when I first, Jesus first started coming to me when I was a little, little girl, six, seven years old. He's always to my right. And I'm always standing to his left. He's always, um, he's always at my right side and I'm always on his left side. He was standing to my right and his feet were bronze. Um, they were like, they had been dipped in bronze, like the actual metal. And we were standing in a church. He took me to this church. And it was a big church, um, and but not not a mega church, but it was a, a nice sized church, and it was full of all kinds of people, like all different ages, races, genders, what have you. And Jesus and I were standing on a stage, and um, I guess the stage, like the platform that you have in church, you know, where like the pastor preaches at the pulpit. 
and it, which was elevated. Okay. And, but Jesus, his back was turned towards the people. So me and him, we were like facing a wall. Okay. And so all of everyone who was in this church was behind us. Okay. But I was turned around because I could see everybody, but Jesus didn't turn around. His, his back was to, towards the congregation. And he told me he wanted me to observe what was going on. And just bear with me if I look down, it's because I've, I had to write all this stuff down with so much. And I have to make sure that I don't miss a single thing. It's extremely important that I don't miss any of this. As I saw him um, with his bronze feet, he said, well, was first spoke to me and he said, my mercies come from the right and my judgment comes from my left. But they must understand that they work together. So in other words, his judgments and his mercies, they work together, okay? Um, the judgment does not come without mercy. Mercy also does not come without judgment. Like they work together. Um, so then that was the first thing he said. Now, there was a notepad that was in front of me. And this notepad was not like a notepad with lines in it. It was a white notepad, like a sketcher's pad, of someone who draws, basically. So if you've ever seen a sketch pad, it's, it's all white and, and, you know, it's rectangle and it doesn't have any, um, any lines or, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry. It doesn't have any lines or anything in it. So, I wasn't holding it. It was like suspended in the air in front of me, like right in front of me. And everything that Jesus said, it would appear on this, on this sketch pad, writing. It was almost like in calligraphy. And everything that he said was written in gold. It was like gold ink or gold something. It was, it was some type of gold ink or what have you, but it would appear, the words would appear on this white sketch pad, everything he said. And so it, when it was in front of me because he wanted me to like, to understand and to take in what he was saying. So the first thing again, he said, is that my mercies come from my right and my judgments come from my left, okay? And again, I saw him with these bronze feet and I saw a bronze sword in his left hand and he was standing there. He told me to observe the church. He said, I want you to, he said, look, I want you to watch. But he kept his back turned. And I turned around and I began to observe what was going on in this, in this church. And the church was very modern looking. It wasn't like any, wasn't like a Catholic church or, you know, anything that looked um, old. It was all new, very contemporary you know, modern type of looking church, you know, with, with, you know, it was like purple carpet and, and, you know, all the comfortable chairs. It wasn't like they were wooden pews or anything. It was a very modern church. Okay. And it was wide. It wasn't so much long as the church was wide. And so I began to observe and I saw this pastor come to the front and he was at the pulpit and he stood up and he, and he said to the church, we're going to have communion. And, and then the people, his armor bearers or what have you, they began to gather um, the, uh, the utensils for, for the people to take communion. And I noticed something that was very odd to me because you know how you go to and you have, and I'm sure, I hope everyone on here is at least taking communion once. So usually like a lot of the churches today, they have like the little, the little cups um, with the little grape juice in it and the little wafers or what have you, like we use, we actually use like kosher grape juice, Kadeem grape juice, and we keep matzahs in our house. And even when we're dealing with our ministry, we do matzahs and, and grape juice. So we have the little cup. We even have, I order them all the time, especially when we have large events. You know, I have the little cups as well. So that's what we're, most of us are used to knowing. So what was so unique about this church is that they had wine glasses. OK, so there was there was these wine glasses and then that had stems um, like you think of a wine glass. And then there were goblets. So if you don't know what a goblet is like, a goblet is like a, um, it, it looks like a, it looks like the vase of a 
of a wine glass like we see it without the stem okay so it's just flat on the bottom but it has that same like dome shape or cone shape that that the wine glass has and that's typically called a goblet okay so there was a combination of wine glasses with stems and then goblets like beautiful but not something you would ever see like in a church to take communion so this is what they were presenting for the, the wine or the grape juice or whatever it was. I'm not really sure. And so this is what the pastor says. He says, all he makes this announcement. He says, all the Republicans stand up and come and take communion. And so all of a sudden I'm looking, I'm like, all of the Republicans, but you know, and so the majority of the church stood up. And they went to, they came forth to, to take their communion. And, and the Lord spoke. He's standing right there. His back is still turned. He says, I want you to go. And I said, well, he says, I want you to go and take communion. So I said, okay, Lord. So I did what he told me to do. And I went down and I went forward to take the communion with the people. And so it took a while for like everybody to come and get um, their communion or what have you. And so, um, and so then um, they went back to their seat and then the pastor said, okay, now I want all the Democrats who were in here to stand up so you could take communion. And I noticed that there was just a very, very, very small group of people who were Democrats. Um, and they were kind of off to, they were to my right, me facing the congregation, but to Jesus, they were to his left, okay? And so they were just like over here in this like this little corner, okay? It would be my left, right over here, <laughs> this little corner. And so the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to go participate. And I'm thinking, I already took it. He says, I want you to go down and get it. So I said, okay, Lord. So I obeyed. So I went down and I noticed there was this woman, this middle-aged black lady, and she had on like this purple, like a lavender type dress. And she was very tall. And she, she, it was like, she saw me. Like when I went with the Republic, nobody saw me. She saw me, like she recognized me. She called my name. She said, Mina. And I looked at her. She looked me right in my face. And she said, she said, Oh, thank God you're here. Thank God you're here. And she says, Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And so I said, Let me, let me get, you know, let me go get the 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 I don't know what they call it, the elements, or let me go get the elements for you. Um, and so I went and I noticed that um there was even though there was a group, I don't know, small group of people, but but the glasses that were set aside for the people who happened to be the Republicans, or excuse me, the Democrats, like they had not set enough glasses aside for them. And like it was only three or four glasses, even though it was more than three or four people, okay? And I went to go grab a glass and I grabbed a goblet, okay? And I went to go grab it to give it to this lady, but I noticed that the glass was dirty, like it was all dirty. And I noticed, I realized that this pastor had given these people dirty glasses, okay? Like they purposely had set aside these dirty glasses for these people to take communion. And I was like, oh no. And I was gonna give it to her and I saw like the dirt and stuff. And I was like, no, no, no. And I said, you can't take this. And she said, I, I said, no, it's dirty. And so I went back and I went to go grab a wine glass and I found a glass on the other side that was clean. And so I give it to this lady and I give her the glass and I give her, you know, the little cracker, whatever it was that was there. And so, so she could take communion. And so um, I didn't understand that. And so I, I watched the, these Democrats, who was a smaller group that took the communion and, and, and they were struggling and because it wasn't enough and they didn't leave them enough on purpose. And um, and so then I'm I'm back and I'm standing with the Lord again. Oh Jesus, dear Lord. And this is what He said. I'm back standing with Him again. And um, hold on, I'm trying to go back to what I was at. This is what He tells me. He said, 
tell them to honor my Passover. Honor my Passover. I commanded them to do this in remembrance of me. They are not doing this. They are not observing this. He continued. He said, the church is divided by politics. He says, they are now preaching politics instead of my salvation. He said, tell them, in my eyes, in my father's house, there is no male or female. I do not see culture. I do not see race. I do not see country. I do not see left. I do not see right. I do not see Republican. I do not see Democrat. He says, tell them to preach my salvation. And then he began to quote, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good tidings to the poor. And then he added in spirit, in spirit. And you know, that was something that Jesus quoted out of Isaiah when he came back from being tempted by the enemy, when he went into the synagogue. And when he had said, he being God the Father, Abba, Elohim had anointed him to bring good tidings to the poor, depending on what version you have. That tidings is the gospel, the good news, to bring good news. The good news is the gospel. The gospel is the introduction to salvation. He said they are not preaching. They being the church, he said the church has stopped preaching his salvation, and instead they have begun preaching politics from the pulpit, and the Lord is angry. He is angry. He said he does not see male or female. He does not see culture. He does not see race. He does not see country. He does not see Republican, and he does not see Democrat. Okay? He said, tell them, tell them, preach my gospel. That's what he said. So the next thing I knew when he, after he said this, he began to turn to face the people and he was turning slowly and I was turning in sync with him. Okay. That, that's, that's nothing to do with me. That's nothing. No, nothing special about me. I was just observing this. And he didn't, he didn't turn fast. He turned very slowly, turned his head and saying, oh my gosh, as he turned his face towards the country and I'm turning with him, like I'm standing back next to him. He's still on my right side. I'm on his, I'm on his left side. As he turned towards the congregation, this light, this piercing, piercing white light just exploded from his face. And he, as he was turning towards the people, this light, this magnificent light shined like boom, like it just filled the whole place. And I couldn't see the people because all I saw was the light like that had came from him. And all I heard was wails. I heard the people, they were wailing. They were, oh my gosh, they were like, they were wailing, they were crying. They were, people were saying, no, no. And they were, they were yelling, they were hiding. You could hear them scrambling and for to hide. And, I was like a little girl and I was looking up at Jesus and I was looking at him, but I saw his face. I saw him. I saw his beard, his full beard. And he always, I always see him the same since I was a little girl. He's always come to me the same. And I saw his beard. I saw his, his hair resting on his shoulders. I saw him, but the people who were in the audience, all they saw was light. And they were shrieking and they were crying and they were trying to scatter and hide from his face. 
I didn't understand it and I'm looking at Jesus and I'm like, I didn't, I didn't say the words, but in my heart, I was like, Lord, I don't understand why, why, why are they, why are they screaming? Why are they crying? Why are they, why are they hiding? Why are they, I didn't understand. Like I, I was expecting the people to have joy, to, to be excited. No, these people were hiding. I didn't understand what was happening. And then he spoke. This is what he said to me. He said, to those who seek my face, the veil will be lifted and they will see my face. But to those who do not seek my face, my light will expose their nakedness. So I understood that these people in the church, they had not saw his face. And this is what he was telling me. He was telling me, he said, they're seeking me, but they're not seeking my face. The face to come face to face with him is that intimate relationship with him. And we're not seeking his face. But he said, my light to those who do not seek my face, my light will expose their nakedness. So that light, when he turned around to the congregation, they were wailing. There was wailing and weeping. And that kind of But I, I couldn't see it. Like, all I saw was light, but I heard it with my ears. I, I heard the screams and the wails and the gnashing of teeth. I heard it. I heard it. And then, again, the the uh, the the white paper, the white notepad was in front of me, and all of this stuff was ready. That was, it was so much, and I was. I was trying to double read it. Like I was reading it and then I was trying to go back and I was thinking like I don't want my senses, all of my senses in this experience. Okay. And I was thinking oh, it's too much. Like I'm not going to remember this. And so I was trying to read it and scan it and read it again because I was trying to retain it in my, within me. So I, I, Cause I knew I had to come back and tell this. And so I was, he began to talk about the tribulation. Oh my gosh, he, he began to, I saw the word tribulation and gold appear and he began to speak. And there was all of these words, all of these words appearing in front of me. And I was trying to read everything because he, he took it from me. He would not let me retain all of this stuff. Like when I came out of the experience, he he had taken it from me. He told me it's not time. It's not time to reveal it. But this is what I was allowed to bring back. He said the sea will roar, which we heard him say and talk about in Matthew chapter 24. He says, and the earth will crack. He said the earth will crack open. And this is what he said to me. He said, many, many. Many of my people will go in the church. Let me make let me make sure I said it right. Many of the people in the church, he said, will go into the tribulation. He said, many. He said, but not all. He said, not all. He's reserved. He has reserved his remnant to escape. To escape. He said, many, many in the church will go into the tribulation. And I heard not a sadness. I heard an anger. I heard an anger. He was angry because I understood. My, and you have to understand when you're in the spirit and when you encounter, when you have a real encounter with God, a real encounter with being in the spirit of the most high and the dwelling in the secret place of the most high, 
you everything that's given to you there are these words that are spoken jesus speaks these words the father speaks these words, and the holy spirit will speak words to you there are the things that they say which they don't talk a lot they're not begging they're not pleading when they say things they say it and and you understand it and then when he says it like he will say a sentence and then there'll be like six sentences that are downloaded into your spirit so that you have like the full understanding of what he's saying. Like you, you don't come out of that experience with questions. You just don't. And I understood this anger. He was angry because of how we have been. He was angry because he knew he was letting me know it didn't have to be that way, but that it was going to be that way because of how we have dealt with him, how we have dealt with one another. He said many, many in the church will be left behind to go through the tribulation, but not, he puts his finger up, he said it, he said, but not all, not all. I've reserved my remnant to escape all of you guys out here arguing see it ain't gonna go down the way you think it's gonna go out we out here arguing out here we got all these people out here arguing pre mid post what have you all this argument and you're carrying each other heretics and all of this stuff the Lord said you're going to be left behind and you don't even have to be left behind but you're going to be left behind because we're not seeking his face and we're not walking in love we're not this this is uh, the other revelation that was given to me <sighs> hey, I did not know I saw his feet in bronze I did not know that bronze represented sin, but there's many scriptures about it. Um, and why the altar and the, and I even teach about this in my coming behind the veil series. And it did, I'm like, it did, it, the Lord taught me this. And then I'm just like, of course, it makes perfect sense. The tabernacle that was divided into three parts, the outer court, the inner court, the Holy of Holies, the bronze was always on the outer court. The outer court, what was in the outer court was the bronze altars, the bronze and altars. The altars were where the, the sacrifices were given. Um, for what? To atone for sins, right? But all of the furniture that was inside the inner court were all made of gold. Even behind the veil with the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant was made of gold. But everything that was bronze was on the outer court. Where, where the sacrifices took place, okay? Bronze represents sin, and the and when Jesus, and when we see Jesus in, with the bronze and feet, which one of the scriptures is Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. I'm going to read it to you real quick. It says, and his feet were polished bronzed, were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. When we see, and there's there's a couple of times in the book of Revelation where we see him with bronze feet, and again also in Daniel chapter ten when Jesus talks, I mean Jesus, when Daniel talks about him being like the Son of Man, um, had also bronze feet. Okay, when we see Jesus with bronze feet, it represents his judgment. He was in the church, and his feet were bronze. Judgment has come to the house of the Lord, saints. Has come to the house of the Lord. The scriptures that I want to give you as well. Um, Psalm 27. I have three that I have to give. So Psalm 27, verse 8 and 9. Psalm 27, verse 8 and 9. The scripture is, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help 
Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. We're not seeking his face. That's what he was saying. We're not seeking his face. We're using him for so many things. You know, we're we're asking him for money. We're asking him to to we're asking him to delay judgment. We're asking him for blessings, for divine help, for you know, a husband, a wife, of you know, we're asking him for children in some cases, we're asking him for a promotion at work, we're asking him to build ministries, we're asking him for all of these things. We're like seeking his hand. We're seeking his hand. We're even laying at his feet. I'll even go as far as saying that, but we're not seeking his face. He said, seek my face. I'm standing there and I see his face. I'm looking at him. I'm looking up at him. And I see his face and I don't understand why. And I'm like a little girl, like all of a sudden I'm small. And that's happened before many times when I'm with him. We're not, I mean, and Jesus, he stands about six feet tall and I'm the tall chick, I'm five foot nine. So there are times where I see him and we're, we're almost, I don't know, there's many times where I'm with him and I, all of a sudden, when I look at him, like I look up, like it, I become, I be, and it's not because his, his height has changed. It's, it's a, it's a humility, it's a reverence, okay? And I'm looking up at him all of a sudden, because when we're first there, we're first standing, uh, you know, next to each other. Like, you know, he's just a little bit taller than me. He's about six, six, one, six. And, and I always see him like that. But all of a sudden, when he turned to that church saying, it was like I had become a little girl. And I'm looking up and I'm not understanding. I see his face, I see his countenance, I see everything. And I'm like, why are they screaming? Why are they wailing? I just, like, I can't get that. That is the most emotional part to me because the church was wailing. They weren't rejoicing, they were wailing, weeping, hiding, scrambling from his light. Exposed their nakedness. Well, the scripture that comes up, and this is not one of the three scriptures that I have to give you, but just as a side note, you know, he talks about the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter three. And those of you guys who don't know, I'm teaching the book of Revelation in our online Bible studies on Thursday nights. And we're, we're like still in chapter two, I think. If we have it, and we're probably, sometimes, I don't even remember where we're at because we're in cha either chapter two or three. We're still going through the, the seven churches. But when he gets to the church of Laodicea in chapter three, remember, remember the church of Laodicea was the rich church. And they say, we have everything, right? And, and Jesus said, you don't realize. You're poor, blind, wretched, miserable, and naked. Now, that may not be the actual order, but I named all of them. Naked, he says, before me. Remember that? So like he goes down this list, he tells them about buying gold for him. But remember, he says, buy your linens from me. Why? Why did he say that? He said that your nakedness, that depending on what version you're, that your nakedness would be covered, that you would not be ashamed before me, before my father. Right. So we know that Adam and Eve way back in the beginning in the garden, right? You know, they didn't know they were naked. You know, there's a lot of speculation that says, well, Adam and Eve believed that they were, you know, that people believed that Adam and Eve were clothed with this light, like what, like what we would call their, their genitalia or what have you. Um, was clothed in light, and and when they sinned, when they ate that fruit, the light lifted. You know, that's, that's what a lot of people believe had happened. You know, this is all, oh, but their eyes were open, um, and they realized they were naked. Remember, God comes in the garden. He's like, well, who told you you were naked, right? But nakedness represents shame. You know, they, they sew these fig leaves together, and then they try to cover their nakedness. Remember, they, they try to cover it. He said, who told you you were naked? Who told you? So then he tells the church a lot of see, you know, buy your linen from me. That your nakedness will be covered. Nakedness represents shame. When we stand naked before the Lord, it's because we are ashamed. We are ashamed. We have no, we haven't done enough works. We haven't bore enough fruit to even cover our nakedness. 
These people are sitting in the churches and we're running our mouths and we're taking up offerings and we're having prophetic gatherings and we're sitting here and we're on television and we're speaking in tongues and we're got all the saints coming together and we're praying in tongues, you know, for Donald Trump or what have you. And we need to pray, we need to pray for the president and we, the witchcraft. And Jesus is saying, you don't even know my face. You don't even recognize my face. And I find it very interesting that this Democrat Republican thing, he told me to watch, you know, and, 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 and I can't keep you guys too long. I just don't want to. I need to get through these last two scriptures, but <sighs> he had me to go take communion with both sides. Now, I'm going to tell you something about me. I'm, I don't consider myself neither Republican or Democrat, and I never have. I do consider myself a conservative. I do. I can, but, but. I am a born again Christian. I am a spirit filled believing follower of Jesus Christ. I don't get into politics. I, they're all corrupted from what I know. I've got family, friends that have dealt with that and in it, and I know things. Okay. I found it so interesting that he said, go take, go take the communion, the Republican group, which was the majority of them. Then when the the, the, the small group that was left out, he said, go take it with them. There was a point he was making in that. He just, I don't, I don't see any of that. You know, and I find that interesting because I've actually heard preachers say, you cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat. What Jesus is saying is this. It has nothing to do with voting Democrat and nothing to do with voting Republican. He's saying, seek my face. Listen, if you seek his face and you hear his voice, you, you're not even going to be, you're not even going to have time to be caught up in that. He's saying, I love them all. And I do not delight in seeing that any of my little ones perish. And so we become biased, racist, prejudiced even. Well, there's the left, the liberal left, the this, that, and God loves them as much as he loved Job smelly behind. Because at one point, you was in the dirt and the dung hill and the miry clay, just like all the rest of them. And he loves them. He loves them the same. Even in their ignorance, he loves them. And it is not our job to sit here and bash them. It is not our job to preach politics from the pulpit. He said, preach my salvation. Preach the coming of the Lord. Preach Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. Preach Yeshua. Don't preach Democrat. Don't preach Republican. No, but we need a vote. We need a... He said, no, stop it. Stop it. He is not pleased. He is not pleased. And he said, observe my Passover. I'm sitting there in the... In, in my hotel room in Chicago, and the dawn talking to the Lord, and I said, Lord, you gotta, you gotta, so what are you saying? I, you want me to tell them to, uh, that they need to observe Passover according to the book of Exodus, because we, I, I observe Passover, I do, you know? He said, my Passover. He kept saying, he didn't even say the Passover. He said, my Passover, not mine is in me, but it's his. They must tell them to keep my Passover. Do this and remember to me. What was the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world that the world may be condemned, but that through him the world would be saved. Salvation. Salvation. And he commanded at the last, what we call the Last Supper, which was Passover that he was observing. And he gives the disciples a new covenant, a new covenant. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember the Passover lamb. Remember what he came to do. We need to start living like him, saints. We're not living like him. We're not living like Jesus. Jesus came for the poor, for the broken, for the rejected, for the despised, for the sinner, for the lame, for the destitute, for the forgotten, for the abandoned. He came for them. He didn't come and hang out with Pharisees. We're becoming Pharisees. 
Remember, those are the main people. They're the, and here's the thing. They're the people that put him to death. Oh, they put Jesus to death. He's in this church. And his back is turned. He's in the church and his back is turned. He's showing his backside to the church, saying. And when he turns around, when they when he turns around to reveal his glory and his majesty, they're weeping and they're wailing. You know, in Zechariah, the prophecy says that they, you know, they will <laughs> they will see him and they will weep, they will mourn those who pierced him, they will look upon him and they will mourn. You know, and I know we and I'm not just talking about the what we call the Jewish people or the Israelites who don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. We can take this all because the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is past, present, and future. We can take this and we can get that's where the Holy Spirit, the Ruha Kodesh, comes in because he can give us new revelations at any second. And think about that. We got a church full of Pharisees. Jesus came for the, he came for the, those who are outside of the church. Oh, but we come out of our darkness. We come out of our strip clubs. We come out of our, our terrible little diabolical backgrounds. And we put on our little, our little suits and our little hats and our little shiny shoes. And we go and we find a little four wall place with a steeple and glass stained windows. And we go sit in it and we put our little money in the bucket and we sing in the choir. We clap our hands and we don't come outside of those four walls ever again. And then we have the audacity to put up signs every six months and say, come out revival. We go into the revival. And then the revival is full of folks that are saved. That's not a revival. The word revive means to, to, to come back from the dead. It's like you've gone in a cold blue. You've gone a cardiac arrest. So if you having a revival in your church and all of y'all sitting up in there, that should tell you who you are. You're dead. You're dead. Jesus said, I didn't come for, I didn't come for those who were well. I came for the sick. When was the last time you went outside your four walls? And I'm not talking about on Thanksgiving. On Christmas, every day, every day. When was the last time you brought a stranger into your home? When was the last time you fed someone who was hungry and thirsty? When was the last time you clothed the naked, both physically and spiritually? Right? But did you leave it to your pastor? Did you leave it to your next door neighbor? Did you leave it to the mother of the church, the person sitting in the pew, the deacon, the deacon? Did you leave it to them so you can just come to church and say, hallelujah, I got my shot on, I can go home? The Lord said, you're not seeking my face. And his light will shine on your nakedness. And you will weep. And you will howl. And you will mourn. Last two scriptures. Psalm 105, verse 3 and 4. Psalm 105 says, let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Seek his face. By scripture, Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He, and I found this to be so significant, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Remember Jesus said in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Right. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, mm. You know, I talked about that idolatry that we have in the church today. And then in this whole Republican Democrat thing, we're making these people into idols. You say, well, we're not making nobody into no idol, Mina. Listen, bye. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. When your entire church service has now consisted of you standing up and talking about, we got to pray for our president and you not preaching salvation, he has become your idol, people. And I don't care what you say, you can get mad, you can put your mad faces, you can put your nasty comments, you can sit there and try to defend him and say, he's King Cyrus, he's God of the Let me tell you something about King Cyrus. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there tonight. 
because this is a serious word. I want you to go back and look at who King Cyrus was. First of all, King Cyrus was a pagan. That's number one. He was an outsider, number two. And he did not worship the God of the Israelites. He really let them go back to their land and and built their temple. Why? Because it was easier to let everyone govern themselves so he can govern them from the outside. He, the Israelites were not the only group of people that King Cyrus did that to. Okay? He was not, he was given a massive authority over groups of people. Okay, but he did not acknowledge the God of the Israelites. He was not a worshiper. Here's the thing. Nebuchadnezzar in the end acknowledged who God, the God of the Israelites were, but not King Cyrus. He was a heathen, a pagan, an unbeliever who just merely allowed them to go back to their land and build the temple. But here's the catch that you guys don't know about King Cyrus. You have to understand that Jeremiah who had preached for 40 years because of their rebellion, God was gonna strip the throne, okay? The throne, remember that? It was King Zedekiah. And in case you guys don't know about your biblical history because you ain't reading your word, King Zedekiah was the last king to sit on the throne from the tribe of Judah. And remember way back in Genesis, right before J uh, Jacob died, he prophesied over all 12 of his children. And when he came to Judah, one of the things he said of Judah was that the scepter would never, um, the scepter would never leave. Like it would never diminish from his his tribe is his, his seed or what have you and i'm not saying that correctly but you guys get my draft the scepter representing a uh, kinghood okay or a priesthood even that it would never leave okay but zedekiah was the last king of judah freestanding king over judah judea israel because judah and and israel were separate then they came together again it was called judea by the time christ came to ever sit on the throne the Cyrus came in and let them go back, but he did not allow them to have a king. And every king that happened after that was ruled by, was given or ruled by another outside authority. Even King Herod, even King Herod's son was ruled by Rome. Then we had Antiochus Epiphanes, who happened during what they called the Dark Ages, the times of the Maccabees. It was, uh, he was Greek, the Greek rulership. They never had a king their own king, a freestanding king to rule over them ever again. You guys out here talking about King Cyrus, King Cyrus, King Cyrus, look at what happened when Cyrus came into power. They, were, they returned to their land, but they never again saw a king, a freestanding king who honored God. Think about that. Finishing the scripture, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from God, the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek your face, O Jacob. Bila. I'm going to close with this. Seek the Lord while it is yet still day. Seek him while he can yet still be found. But the time is coming when you will seek him and you will not find him. You will call out to him and he will not answer you. There is a time coming that's in scripture. Seek his face. And don't let him, don't let it be that when you come face to face with him, that the light that shines through him and upon him will uncover your nakedness. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for letting me in your homes this evening. Yes, I will leave this up. And yes, I will upload it to YouTube because I have to. Read those scriptures. Go over them. Search your heart. As I said last time, listen, we're, this is winding down. Oh, God, it's winding down. It's winding down, saints. And things are going to continue to get more and more and more and more intense. Um, we need to prepare. If, if, you put your, if you came off your walls, you need to get back up on your walls. If you put your swords down, you need to pick up two swords. 
If you took off your armor, you need to put it back on. Because it's here. It's begun. God bless you all. Thank you for letting me into your home. Until next time, good night. Shalom.